my name is Arash Safai. I'm a senior medical science liaison with Greenwich Biosciences. Uh, and so I am a paid employee of the company. And for today's talk, we're going to review a background on cannabinoid science, general about the category and cannabinoids uh, uh, generally. Then we'll follow up that discussion with a look at the Epidiolex clinical trials. And lastly, we'll take a look at the USPI for Epidiolex. Uh, if, you please have any, if you have any questions, please ask along the way. If I'm not able to answer them, I'm happy to meet after the presentation and answer any questions individually as well. So to get us started, uh, I think it goes without saying that cannabis has been used for thousands of years. It's been dated back to the time of the Chinese emperors. It, it goes back to uh, the Egyptians. And uh, it kind of isn't a surprise that this plant has been utilized for thousands and thousands of years. And it's not up until recently uh, that the science has been elucidated. Specifically, uh, after, the 19, after 1900 and within the 1900s, much of the understanding of the compounds within the cannabis plant has been elucidated. Uh, specifically in the 1940s, CBD and THC were isolated from the plants and characterized. And it wasn't up until the 1980s and 90s that a better understanding of the endocannabinoid system was found. And this was research primarily conducted by Dr. Mashulam. It led to an understanding of the cannabinoid receptors and the endogenous cannabinoids or the endocannabinoids AEA and 2AG, which our body produces itself. The three pharmacologically active classes of cannabinoids are listed here on this slide, being composed of phytocannabinoids, and as I just mentioned, the endocannabinoids, which our body makes itself, and the class of synthetic cannabinoids, or those that are made in the lab. And we'll look at each one of these individually in the next few slides. First, starting with the endocannabinoids, which of which AEA or anandamide is the most well uh, known along with 2AG, the second endocannabinoid listed on that slide. These are the two most well characterized and researched endocannabinoids at this point and there is active research being conducted to define and better elucidate the uh, subsequent compounds listed on this slide. And uh, in the middle, you can see the receptor targets, mainly being CB1 and CB2. And we'll again talk about that in just a few slides and the action of those cannabinoids, endocannabinoids at each one of those receptors. The second class of cannabinoids would be the synthetic class. And these are molecules which are made in the chemistry lab, synthetic a chemistry means of producing cannabinoids. And uh, there is precedent for synthetic THC being previously FDA approved, uh, mainly dronabinol, nabilone, and then another formulation of dronabinol, those being Schedule 3 and Schedule 2 compounds. Uh, again, I'll state it one more time. These are synthetic THC, which is one type of cannabinoid and we'll be talking about a different kind as well in subsequent slides. The third class of cannabinoids can be defined as phytocannabinoids, or those derived from the plants, the cannabis plant itself. And uh, the term phytocannabinoids actually refers to the cannabinoids derived from cannabis and also others that are found in plants ubiquitous within nature. So here on the left, you can see that the echinacea plant has a type of phytocannabinoid, as well as this flower, yellow flower in the middle from South Africa, which has CBG, or the parent compound of THC and CBD. That's 
uh, notated on the right hand side and the bullet points in the middle. And the black pepper uh, itself has beta caryophyllin, which is characterized as a phytocannabinoid as well. So these are compounds that are ubiquitously found within nature in various types of plants. And now specifically, we'll talk about the dip different types of cannabinoids found within the cannabis plant, some of which are listed on the right-hand side over there. In total, there's more than 100 different types of cannabinoids found within the cannabis plant. And before we get into the specifics of that, I'd like to just quickly mention the four different product-based categories which cannabinoids can be found on the market today. Uh, first is defined by the hemp category, uh, which by law must have less than 0.3% THC. The hemp plant is mainly used for textiles and fibers, uh, clothing and such. Um, and is Schedule 1. Uh, so right now, uh, the cannabis plant is defined as a Schedule 1, and any components of the cannabis plant, including hemp, are also Schedule 1 category. Uh, there's one exception to that rule, which uh, has just received FDA approval, and I'll get to that later on in this talk. The second category, uh, going to the third column there, is medical marijuana. Uh, product-based category. Here in California, uh, we were the first state to receive medical marijuana as uh, passed by law back in 1996. Uh, that allows a patient to get a recommendation from a doctor and the patient then takes that recommendation to the dispensary and is provided with a product. Uh, the third bucket or the second column here is recreational marijuana. Uh, this was passed into law in California earlier this year, and the proposed uses for uh, cannabis in that regard are mainly for social uh, interaction and euphoric purposes. And this is in contrast to the last category, the final column, describing the pharmaceutical formulation of cannabinoids, which must pass the rigor of FDA standards all the way from preclinical standards through good clinical practice, good laboratory practice, good manufacturing practice. And in the case of this uh, topic, because it's derived from a plant, good agricultural practice as well. And abiding by all of these standards results in a consistent product that has batch to batch consistency and uh, has been uh, granted FDA uh, regulatory status based on the testing that has been conducted. Now looking into some of the more specifics about the plant itself, the family is listed up there on the middle top of this slide and the cannabis sativa is the species with the varieties being defined as sativa or indica or ruderalis and the definition of those terms is based on how the plant looks so we call that morphological definition that is to say traditionally the sativa plant has been a tall and more narrow plant as you can see on the left the plant next to that would be the indica variety. So right, these are all cannabis plants, these are all sativa species, and we're talking about the differences between the varieties now. And the second one is the indica variety, which is shorter and more broad-leafed. And historically, you would be able to look at the plant and see whether it was a taller, more narrow-leafed, or shorter, more broad-leafed, and therefore say whether it's indica or sativa. Uh, nowadays, there's been extensive interbreeding and crossbreeding between these species um, and varieties, and so that uh, morphological definition has sort of uh, not been applicable uh, to date, or any longer, I should say. Specifically within the plant itself, the cannabinoid content, as you can see, is mostly found within the seeded female buds and the unseeded female buds, 
with the unseeded female buds having approximately two and a half fold increase in cannabinoid content. This is because the energy that would otherwise go into the production of seeds in the unseeded plant, there's no seeds, and that energy goes into extra cannabinoid production, which is why you have more cannabinoid production in the unseeded female buds. And specifically within, within the buds uh, are these little structures you see in the middle of the slide, these lipid uh, crystalline-like bulbous structures. These are called trichomes, and that's specifically where the cannabinoids are housed in the plants itself. Not only are the cannabinoids housed there, the terpenes are also within the trichomes. And now getting into a little bit more science in detail, uh, this here is the uh, carbon backbone structure for CBD, which can be defined as a terpenophenolic compound, and it's a C21 skeleton and the chemical structure of CBD, which on this slide is shown on the top right, can be distinguished from the top left or Delta 9 THC by simply one hydroxyl group, one extra OH group. And I'll just walk over to the screen and show you where that is. So you can see two hydroxyl groups there, one hydroxyl group there. That is the main distinction, actually in fact the only distinction in the chemical structure between THC and CBD, leading to different effects within the body. So THC does bind to the cannabinoid type 1 receptor that we discussed. CBD with that extra alcohol group ha binds at extremely low affinity with low pharmacologically active, uh, at a low pharmacolo pharmacologically active concentration. Yes, question. Okay, so, um Yes. Which is your one plant that's more specific to a certain type of, of seizure than another? Uh, I can speak only to the data and the compounds that have been researched to demonstrate efficacy of seizure reduction, and currently only CBD cannabidiol in the Epidiolex formulation has been demonstrated uh, to do such. Going into a little bit more detail on the cannabinoid type 1 and cannabinoid type 2 receptors, which these compounds bind to, uh, CB1 is found at the presynaptic nerve terminal. This may bit be a bit more detailed than asked, but I thought it'd be okay to discuss it. Uh, and the action of cannabinoids at CB1 results in retrograde modulation of the release of inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters. I'm happy to go into that in more detail after the talk if you'd like. And CB2 receptors are found on immune active cells within the GI tract and uh, are specifically expressed following nerve injury. <clears throat> As I briefly mentioned, uh, THC does act via CB1, and it's been demonstrated that CBD does not. So I quickly wanted to just mention some of the other areas of research that are being thought, uh, that are thought to be the mechanisms for CBD and how it works in the body, uh, specifically the G protein coupled receptors, uh, adenosine receptors, and the trip v1 receptors and channels and uh, preclinical research has suggested a broad potential broad therapeutic potential uh, in cell survival neuronal excitability an inflammatory response neuronal plasticity and neural protection and clinical evidence suggests that cannabinoids may have therapeutic potential in antispasticity, which we'll get into. Anti uh, excuse me, uh, antispasticity is based on a different product. We'll get into the anticonvulsant effects. Uh, the antiemetic, analgesic, and appetite stimulant effects are all based on the FDA synthetic products that I mentioned uh, previously. <clears throat> so as a brief uh, review of this portion of the cannabinoid science, it has a rich 
history dating back over 5,000 years, and the 20th century regulations of Schedule I categorization have limited some of that research. There are three classes of pharmacologically active cannabinoids, the, those derived from the plants, those made in the labs, and um, those that our body makes. Uh, they, CB1 and CB2 receptors are uh, binding, uh, THC is binding to those receptors, and there are other targets that are proposed for an active area of research not yet defined for CBD, and a lot of uh, potential therapeutics for cannabinoids yet to be discovered, and obviously it's a very active area of research. <clears throat> so getting into then uh, Epidiolex, which received FDA approval. This is a cannabidiol oral solution in a sesame seed oil formulation. Uh, it received FDA approval back in June on the 25th. And uh, because it was deemed by the FDA to have medical use, uh, was uh, passed over to the DEA, who then had 90 days to reschedule that compound. Uh, several weeks ago, the DEA rescheduled Epidiolex to a Schedule 5 classification. And uh, as of now, it is the only plant-derived cannabinoid to uh, be scheduled as such. And we'll get into the clinical trial uh, data right now. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, cannabinoids, uh, this in particular CBD, is one of 100 unique cannabinoids. Uh, and CBD is one of the most abundant and has a distinct pharmacological profile. It has demonstrated anticonvulsant effects in humans, and the mechanism of action is thought to be multimodal and still an active area of research. And the pharmaceutical formulation of cannabidiol, again, is called Epidiolex. And um, let's see, I mentioned it's in a sesame seed oil. I mentioned the uh, abiding to the regulatory standards of consistency, quality, and characterization. And I also did mention that it's produced according to uh, good manufacturing practices. Because of all these topics that we've been discussing, uh, it should be clear at this point that it is distinct from dispensary-based products based on these four topics uh, listed in these columns here. There is phase three clinical data in large patient populations to determine the safety and efficacy of these rare and severe uh, pediatric onset epilepsies for which it's indicated. The manufacturing controls are also in, in place. We've, we've discussed that as well. Uh, the legal characteristics are such that it is a schedule five as being rescheduled by the DEA and it does meet the quality standards that the FDA sets in place. Yes? Is there any trials on um, Unfortunately, I'm only able to talk about the indication that it received uh, with the FDA, which is for uh, seizures associated in Dravet syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome in patients two years and older. Um, I have to limit my answer to that. What was your question? Yes, question. Uh, for the first question, so the CBD cannabidiol is derived from the plant itself, so it's not synthesized. In the Epidiolex formulation, the other ingredients are sesame seed oil. No, no additional. No, no additional anything else. Um, sesame seed oil, strawberry flavoring for palatability, um, and it has less than 0.1% THC. 
And that's, again, a known thing every time consistent batch to batch. It will always be exactly the same. Yes. So it does. The synthetic THC that we mentioned earlier, approved by the FDA, was has the anti-emesis indication. That's THC. This is CBD, and um, I am again only able to stick to the data that has been demonstrated uh, in Dravet syndrome and in Lennox Gastaut syndrome for uh, seizure reduction. Yes. Uh, that second portion of her question is it uh, prescribed as a monoster? Oh, second part of that question. Yes, I apologize. Uh, in our clinical trials, it was always used in combination with other drugs, other anti-epileptic drugs. Yes? You said it has a strawberry flavor. Does that mean it has sugars in it? No. Uh, it has sucralose, which is ketogenic diet compatible. A brief description of the clinical trial uh, LGS and Dravet syndrome program Overview, it began back, the phase three trials began back in 2015, and um, as we mentioned here in 2018, already those have been completed and there's FDA approval, and I will quickly show you what the trial design of those studies looked like. It consisted of a four-week baseline observation period, after which patients were randomized a double, in a double-blind fashion to one of three arms, the high dose treatment arm of 20 milligram per kilogram per day, the 10 milligram per kilogram per day dose, and a placebo arm. After completion of the trial, there was a down titration period after which patients had the option to enroll into an open label extension study, um, and uh, that has been ongoing since. Yes. Question. Um, is this given separate from the seizure meds, and if so, why is it given at a different time? Um, I am not a practicing physician, so I can't provide recommendations on dosing. Um, maybe that would be more appropriate for an MD. I, I did my PhD training, so I'm a basic scientist, okay, not a practicing you. physician. Sir, sure. <laughs> Uh, and what were we looking for in those trials, the primary endpoint, uh, I'll just finish this slide and come to your question afterwards. Uh, the primary endpoint was a median percent change in drop seizures or convulsive seizures in the 14-week treatment period. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide is that the 14-week treatment period consisted of a two-week titration period where patients were eventually put on a stable dose and then maintained on that dose for 12 weeks. So in total, two weeks plus 12 weeks was 14 weeks. And we were looking at the change in seizure frequency before starting the drug and then after at the end of that 14 weeks. Uh, the convulsive seizures was the primary endpoint for the Dravet trial, trials. And the drop seizures was the primary endpoint reduction, median percent reduction in drop seizures was the primary endpoint for the Lennox Gasto syndrome trials and the definition of those types of seizures are shown in the bottom of this slide. The key inclusion and exclusion criteria for, the, for all of these trials are shown here. Uh, the indication is for patients age two and older. This is based on this uh, clinical trial data which for which there were no patients under the age of two that were studied, so that is why it has that indication, which we'll see in writing in a few slides. Um, and for the purposes of time, I'm just going to try and breeze through some of these slides here. Um, and I'll come back to your question. Yes, please. So, it's going back about three slides where you talked about the trial. Yeah. Um, were the baseline AEDs the same across the board, or did they vary? 
There was variability in the baseline AEDs. On average, patients were on three, a median of three anti-epileptic drugs during the trials and had attempted up to six on average prior to enrollment within the trials. Um, the two most common were valproate and clobazam, and then there was variability after that. Um, and I will quickly jump to the uh, results of those trials, which are demonstrated here on this slide, where in study one, there was a 43.9% reduction in the treatment arm compared to 21.8% in placebo. In LGS study two, in the high dose, 20 milligram per kilogram per day, there was a 40, what is it, 43, 41.9% reduction in seizure burden over that 14 week treatment period. The 10 milligram is shown in the green bar next to that, and the placebo is shown in the gray. And in the Dravet syndrome trial, the number was 38.9% in the treatment arm versus 17, uh, 13, excuse me, 13.3 in the placebo arm. And all of these results were found to be statistically significant at a p-value of 0.01 or less. And here uh, is the safety data that was found from those trials. It is pooled between the studies, and you can see that somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, transaminase elevations, fatigue, malaise and asthenia, rash, and uh, insomnia, sleep disorders, poor sleep quality, and infection were the main uh, adverse events that were experienced in patients at a rate of 10% or greater. What kind of infections? Upper respiratory tract infections. And here we have uh, the numbers for the uh, discontinuation rates in the trial. So patients uh, for various reasons uh, their doctors decided to take them out of the trial. And uh, I need to also just quickly mention that uh, because transaminase elevations was noted in one of three, or in three different circumstances, um, that it was called out as a safety precaution and uh, required a monitoring for transaminase elevations. So um, physicians are required to monitor transaminase levels in patients who are going to be taking Epidiolex at baseline one month, three month, and six month post dose, and then periodically afterward as clinically indicated or if there are dosage adjustments. And finally, uh, a quick peek at what the exact language is for the indication and usage of Epidiolex on the top in the blue bar. I verbalized that previously. Uh, patients are to start at five milligrams per kilogram per day in the first week, and this is dosed two times a day. And then after the first week, there can be an up titration to 10 milligram per kilogram per day, which is the recommended stable dose. And then of course, as I mentioned, uh, the hepatic impairment issue uh, would require a dose decrease according to the status of that hepatic impairment, either by one half in moderate hepatic impairment or by one fifth dose decrease in severe hepatic impairment. And that concludes the talk. Thank you very much for your time. And now I just want to make a clear delineation between my talk as an employee of the company and Dr. Hussein will be talking on a similar topic uh, for his portion of the talk in his own words as well. Thank you. There's a titration to go up, but is there any titration or weaning to come off? There's no specific schedule to come off. Uh, there have been plenty of patients who have come off cold turkey and been okay. In general, we try to go as slow as is reasonable. So it really depends on the situation. So. Uh, well, we'll let him off the hook there. Yeah. He can try to escape. Uh, my name is Sean Hussein. I'm a pediatric epilepsy specialist at UCLA. Uh, I've done a lot of work with cannabidiol. And unlike Dr. Safai, I am not as restricted about what I can say. That said, I have a lot of disclosures here. 
so I do uh, about 80% of my time is devoted to research, and I have partnerships with many companies in industry, including GW Pharma, which is the parent organization of Greenwich Biosciences, which is the manufacturer of Epidiolex. Uh, I also do some work with one of their competitors, which is Insys. They're developing a synthetic cannabidiol for the treatment of epilepsy. Uh, and multiple other companies that are have developed already or are developing therapies for infantile spasms, Lennox Gastaut syndrome, and Dravet syndrome. So take into consideration all these potential conflicts. And if you ask me a question that I think exposes one of those conflicts, I'll try to let you know. Okay, why don't, why don't we start here? I think a lot of folks in the community are, are getting their information online or in the media when it comes to cannabidiol. Uh, and I think that the, the cannabidiol world really exploded with this weed documentary. Uh, this is about four years ago. And Sanjay Gupta you know, famously changed his mind about weed. And he profiled, among other patients, this little girl named Charlotte Feige. And she suffered from a disorder called Dravet syndrome. And this is one of the two forms of epilepsy for which Epidiolex is approved. This is a, a pretty bad kind of epilepsy. Uh, it's pretty homogeneous, meaning that all the most of the patients, the vast majority, have the same gene that is problematic and that is causing their epilepsy. It's called SCN1A. And they have multiple seizure types. They often have really bad epilepsy. They often have really bad cognitive consequences of their epilepsy. This girl was treated with this plant, which then bore her name. You know, a lot of people have heard of Charlotte's Web. It was produced by this photogenic band of brothers who are the face of the realm of caring. And their product has since kind of morphed into this thing called uh, uh, CW Botanicals Hemp Extract. And there are a, a couple different products. So we'll, we'll talk about this some more. There are also lots of other community sourced or dispensary sourced products. And this is just a small sampling of them. It used to be that you had to go to a, a dispensary. This is one near where I live. Uh, and that's really not true anymore. A lot of these dispensaries are much higher scale, upscale these days, and you can get a lot of these products online even. So you can order from Amazon. A lot of the products are direct order, so meaning you, you contact the grower and the, the manufacturer of these products and you can order online. You can go directly to their manufacturing facility sometimes. Okay, so if you were just to look online and learn about medical marijuana or, or hemp as a treatment for epilepsy, you would immediately get the impression that it is working for everybody. You would occasionally see someone go online and say, it didn't work for my kid. But you would get this impression that it was working for everybody. If instead you were in my pediatric epilepsy clinic and you were a spy and you were listening to the conversation, you'd probably get the opposite impression, that it wasn't working all the time, but that every once in a while it was. Okay, and this is something that just does not get out in the media. So I, I want to highlight this. And how do we reconcile this? Why is the experience online so much different than what we're seeing in the clinic? Many reasons. One big one is that when it comes to a product that is federally illegal, people are generally not motivated to, to describe using that product when it didn't work. You know, they, they, they don't want to put that information out there if it's not of benefit and if it exposes them to any risk. The other bias, on the other hand, you know, why would it not be working in my clinic? Well, the problem with my clinic is there is about a seven month wait to see me. So most of you would say, ah, I'll skip this guy. Let's go see someone who has a one month wait. The people who are willing to wait that long to get into my clinic often have really, really hard to control epilepsy. And even if a product is effective in general, it might not be effective among the subset of patients I see. So when, when, you, when, I sh when I give you this pessimistic experience from my clinic, that's probably an underestimate of how effective it might be. And, and we totally recognize that. So things got a little bit higher quality when it comes to research back in, this was 2013, and there was a survey of a Facebook group of parents who were using marijuana products to treat their children. And what they, they, they looked at uh, 19 kids with epilepsy, the majority of which had Dravet syndrome. And the majority of parents were reporting 80% or greater reduction in seizures. And this was pretty noteworthy. You know, this is a, a hard to control epilepsy and we're seeing a lot of patients doing really well. But the problem with this was that we didn't really know who these patients and parents were. We didn't have enough details about, you know, the, the kinds of seizures that those, those uh, 
uh, patients had, and we weren't directly measuring their seizures. We weren't counting on them. We were counting on volunteers to participate in an online survey, but it was still useful. We followed this up uh, with a survey from UCLA, which was similarly low quality, and we looked at a couple different disorders, including lennox gastaut syndrome and infantile spasms. So we're going to talk in the next hour about infantile spasms if you want to hang out. So we'll just briefly say that uh, there are many different causes of infantile spasms. So unlike Dravet syndrome, which is mostly due to SCN1A mutations, infantile spasms has hundreds of potential causes. There is an EG or abnormality called hips arrhythmia, and the seizures that these kids get are called infantile spasms or epileptic spasms. The second disorder, this is uh, an improved indication for epidox. This is lennox gastaut syndrome. And like infantile spasms, there are many different causes. Uh, it is often characterized by intellectual disability, many different types of seizures, and a pattern on EEG called slow spike and wipe. But I, don't, I don't want you to get bogged down in the details, but just recognize that the, the, the disorders for which ep epidiolex has been studied were really hard to control epilepsy. These were patients who were often on multiple medications, as Dr. Savai just said, and it is noteworthy that they responded to a therapy in this trial. Question? Uh, the question was, was epidiolex effective for myoclonic seizures? Uh, I would say we don't actually know. And the, and the reason is because myoclonic seizures are really hard to count. The outcome of interest for these trials for lennox gastaut syndrome was convulsive seizures. Uh, but I would also say that it's unusual that a drug really helps one kind of seizure in a given patient and doesn't touch another one. So I, I would bet that it is effective. And when you think about Dravet syndrome, one of the main seizure types are myoclonic seizures. Uh, so, yeah, you know, could Dr. Safai come up here and say that it works for myoclonic seizures? He couldn't say that. But I could say I'm pretty sure it does. Okay, so these are childhood onset epilepsies. This kind of gives you a sense of the timeline. The one other aspect to point out is that infantile spasms start usually before a year, and they often morph into lennox gastaut syndrome in patients who aren't responding. Okay? Okay, so we did this internet survey of our own, and we saw, lo and behold, among about 200 uh, parents who responded to this anonymous online survey, that it was working really well for a group that included patients with infantile spasms and, and LGS. And then we looked at a group with Dravet syndrome, or SMEI, and they were also doing great. And then we looked at the patients who had other forms of epilepsy, and they were also doing great. And we saw this thing that everyone was doing great, and we thought, ah, oh, where have I seen this before? I've seen this. You know, so this is an internet survey which really mirrors what we're seeing in online reporting of benefit. So that wasn't a big surprise. But what we wanted to figure out was, well, is, you know, is this bias? Is this real? Uh, and that led to a, a series of other studies. One of them was pretty interesting. This happened in the epicenter of medical marijuana development in Colorado. And at the Children's Hospital of Colorado, they had a large population of patients who were using uh, Charlotte's Web and other cannabidiol products and they wanted to compare the patients who were Colorado natives to patients who immigrated to Colorado so to speak so did not have access to these products in their home state or home country and then traveled and moved to Colorado to access these products they wanted to say well is there any difference in the perceived benefit among these two groups so they had 41 families who uh, were native to Colorado, 34 who moved there, and they saw that 22% of the natives were seeing pretty good responses, but almost 50% of those who immigrated to Colorado were having great benefit. So how, how could this be? Anybody know? Lifestyle. Some people say it's the elevation. Yeah, so it's a combination of all of these things. It, now, it, it could be a placebo-like effect because the folks who are willing to uproot their family and move to another state to access a therapy are people who already believe in the potential benefit of that product. And if you already believe in the benefit, you are going to see more benefit than someone who doesn't. It could also be that the parents who were willing to uproot their families kind of did their homework and they saw that, oh, well, there are certain types of epilepsy that see some benefit. Maybe they made a more informed decision to try 
a cannabidiol product in the first place, and maybe that's why they were selling a little better. So this isn't definitive by any sense, but it does point to some potential bias, and that was why we really needed placebo-controlled trials to figure this out. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of work, a lot of it uh, sponsored by GW Pharmaceuticals and their associated laboratories, showing that cannabidiol works in a variety of animal models of epilepsy. So these are mice or rats who have epilepsy given to them, and we saw that it had dose-dependent benefit across many models, and that in comparison to a lot of pre-existing pharmaceutical options for the treatment of epilepsy, they're better tolerated. So this is a picture of something called a rotorod, and what you do is you give the, the rat the medication of interest, and you put them on this thing, and you start spinning them, and you see if they can hang on. Now when you give rats things like dilantin, they often fall off because they get dizzy, if you give them a ton of cannabidiol, they can hang on. So that's a signal that it's probably pretty well tolerated. Unfortunate for these poor rats, but their, their suffering has done actually a lot for humans. What really changed uh, the picture was the conduct of three big randomized controlled trials, which uh, Dr. Safai has mentioned so far. And I would summarize them just in one slide. And what you can see is the group you know, in each of, so these were three different studies. You've got the first Rave study on the left, two separate Lennox Gastaut syndrome trials, and the patients were randomized to get either cannabidiol or get a placebo. So the placebo was an oil that looked just like the cannabidiol product, but didn't have any cannabidiol in it. And in all three of these studies, you can see that the patients in green, those who were randomized to cannabidiol, were getting more benefit, that they were having fewer seizures. And the y-axis here is the patients who were having at least 50% of their seizures wiped out. And there's pretty good consensus that that is a meaningful outcome. Okay, so let's talk about this interaction with Onfi. You've probably heard about this. So Onfi is, is a pretty popular epilepsy drug. It also goes by the name Clobazam, is the generic name. And if you give a patient, so we'll say that this is Joe. Joe is getting Onfi as treatment for his epilepsy. And when you check his blood, there is some clobazam, that's onfi, in red in his blood. And there's also a bunch of this thing called N-desmethyl clobazam. So when clobazam gets into your body, it passes through your liver, and some of it stays as clobazam. Some of it turns into this N-desmethyl clobazam. Both of these chemicals are effective in fighting seizures. Think about another patient. So we talked about Joe who took the, the Onfi. Now we've got Jill who's taking just cannabidiol. And you check her blood and there's basically some cannabidiol in there. There are a few metabolites of cannabidiol as well, but not important for our purposes here. What happens when you see a third patient, we'll call him John, who gets the same dose of Onfi as Joe and the same dose of cannabidiol as Jill? and you check his blood, and it's a very different story. There's about the same amount of clobazam on average. There's quite a bit, about three times as much in decimal of clobazam in general, and there's actually a little bit more cannabidiol. And yet, I already forgot his name. John, John on, on the right, I gotta practice this talk more. John on the right took the same doses, and yet his blood is showing a very different profile. So there, the point here is that there's an interaction that when you mix these two together, both drugs are likely potentiated in many patients. The problem is it's kind of inconsistent. This happens in some patients and not others. So this has made it a little bit difficult to interpret these trials. So going back to the summary slide of those three big randomized controlled trials, there has been some concern that some of this benefit has actually been the drug interaction, that maybe patients were doing well because they were on ONFI, and their blood levels of onfi in one of the metabolites went up. Sure. My husband is on onfi, and so I'm missing mine and him have. In the future, if he were to be a candidate for this epidiolex, in your opinion, would he have to be um, weaned off of the two other medications that they have? Not necessarily. It would depend how well those drugs were working. And there could certainly be an interaction, but you just want to be careful. You want to check blood levels beforehand and keep track as you introduce the new drug, whether that's cannabidiol or anything else. Okay. 
Okay, so we saw the same kind of interaction in a different patient. So now we're going to talk about a different kind of epilepsy. So this was a patient who was 12 years old who was having horrific seizures, was having hundreds of seizures per day. Uh, we didn't know why. She had failed many medications. She was stuck in the pediatric ICU at UCLA. She could not escape the ICU because every time we reduced the medications of drugs that were practically keeping her in a coma, the seizures came back. We were getting pretty desperate. We were about to maybe cut out a big piece of her brain with, a, with an epilepsy surgery that we were hoping would save her life. Uh, and then uh, GW Pharma, we, we asked them, could we try your product that is still in clinical trials and that is not FDA approved? And they said, yes. And then we asked the FDA and they said, your situation sounds pretty dire, go for it. And then we asked the DEA and they said, okay, we'll make an exception. And it worked pretty well. Now this girl also was on Onfi though. And what happened to her blood levels? They kind of skyrocketed. So this is with each sequential blood draw, we're seeing the onfi blood level or clobazam in red climbing, and the N-desmethylclobazam is climbing as well. So in her case, yes, we had this massive big save that we rescued this girl and she's doing great now. But did she benefit? It was it definitely the cannabidiol that helped her? Was it the epidiolex? Yeah, we're not quite sure. What is reassuring though now is some data that's come from GW uh, Pharma and Greenwich Biosciences showing that even the patients who, are, who entered these studies and were not on ONFI were getting similar benefit. Okay, so in this slide it's a little bit complicated, but having a taller column is good. Those who were getting cannabidiol are in blue. Those who were getting the placebo were in gray. And you can see the blue group is consistently doing better than the gray group across the board. Now the top three graphs, these are the patients on ONFI. The bottom is those not on ONFI. What we're seeing though is that the patients who were on ONFI had bigger benefits. And it's probably because of this interaction. Okay? So a lot of people will say, well, is it better to be on ONFI or not on ONFI? And the answer is unfortunately it depends. In general, I would say it's probably better to be on ONFI and take advantage of this interaction. Uh, but you could get into trouble too. So this is definitely a situation where you'd want to engage your neurologist to help make that decision. Uh, but the, the other big take home message here is that cannabidiol is effective on its own. Okay, and that's a relatively new, well-supported statement. Okay, to sum up the pharmaceutical development of, of uh, cannabidiol, uh, GW Pharma and now Greenwich Biosciences within the United States has, has kind of led the way and they now have approvals for Drave and Linux Cisteau. They have a phase two study underway for tuberous sclerosis complex associated epilepsy. Uh, they had a program for infantile spasms which has been paused. And Insys Therapeutics, this competitor who is developing a synthetic cannabidiol, is uh, now launching a phase three trial for infantile spasms. And we'll talk about that in the next hour if you want to hang out. Okay. Is there any abuse potential of cannabidiol? Go online, they will tell you no. Are any of these patients getting high? If you go online, they will generally tell you no. There are a few patients who have uh, been on these products and come to clinic and said, you know what, my kid was acting high. I tried the product and I felt pretty loopy after I took it. I suspect that that was because the products were relatively low quality and that in addition to cannabidiol there were probably other cannabinoids or other things in those products. Okay. Now Greenwich Biosciences has now uh, publicized some, some great data and how would you know if there's abu abuse potential? Well, you go out and you recruit adult recreational drug users who are healthy and you give them a bunch of drugs and you ask them do you like this? Would you take it again? And which drug of abuse does this most resemble? Okay, this is great information. Okay, so let, let me help you, help you decode this, this chart here. Okay, so drug liking. So the higher the bar, the more these subjects like the drug. Above that dotted line means they liked it. Below that dotted line means they didn't like it. You can see pretty much across the board, they were either neutral or they liked it. The gray is placebo. So this sounds like this experiment was on par. So they got a placebo. They didn't like it, but they did not not like it either. You give him, them alprazolam. So this is Ativan. So this is a relatively popular drug of abuse. There are certainly more popular drugs, but this group said, oh yeah, we kind of like it. 
they were given dronabinol, so this is a synthetic THC. This is the main ingredient in most recreational marijuana. And they said, ooh, yes, we do like this one. And then they gave them three different, but all relatively big doses of cannabidiol. And you can see those bars are just riding that, that dotted line. They didn't like it, but they did not like it. And this is actually pretty reassuring data that, that cannabidiol by itself, at least the epidiolex, has no abuse potential. Okay. And the DEA looked at this data and they said, yes, we agree. This is a well-designed study. We will reclassify it. Okay, so before last month, all marijuana products were classified as Schedule One, meaning that they had no recognized medical use or benefit and that they posed a substantial risk of abuse potential. And then after this data, the DEA changed their tune and they said, okay, Epidiolex, you are now Schedule Five. And this means that there is an accepted medical use and there is a pretty low risk of abuse. So this was an appropriate decision. What has been debated is what they did with all other forms of cannabidiol products. All of these, even some that relatively closely resemble Epidiolex, are all still Schedule One, And the DEA is saying these products do not have an accepted medical benefit and they pose a high risk of abuse. A lot of us in the scientific community think this is not entirely scientific. Uh, let me leave it at that. We'll, we'll maybe come back to that. Okay, so now we have, since last week, Epidiolex is on the market. It can be prescribed. And we have all of these other cannabidiol products. I'm going to lump them all together, and it's a little bit unfair because this is a, a very diverse group of products. But we've got the, the medical marijuana out there, which is usually a THC-rich and CBD-poor product. We've got CBD oil, which is usually very high CBD, very low THC, but some THC. We've got hemp oil, which is kind of the same as CBD oil, but below a specific threshold that's very low as to how much THC is in there. Uh, and these are all basically names for the same thing. And their main characteristics is that they tend to be whole plant extracts. So this is not a purified product like Epidiolex that only has cannabidiol. These have usually a lot of cannabidiol, but they have a little bit of other stuff and almost always a little bit of THC. Okay, so let's kind of compare these and go through the pros and cons. Let's just check the time here. Ooh, okay. I'm actually speaking for the next hour, so we won't annoy anyone if we go over time. Okay, so Epidiolex versus other. Who is supported by rig rigorous clinical trials? Epidiolex, no one else. That is absolutely clear. Effectiveness. What is the impression of, of effectiveness out there in the community? High for both of these. What is the quality of that data? Very high for Epidiolex, generally pretty darn low, unfortunately, for all of these other products. It doesn't mean that they don't work. My bet is that most of these do, but the quality of data supporting their use is low. And, and that is the main reason why regulators like the FDA and DEA have looked at these products differently. How about safety? The impression is that they are both pretty darn safe. Um, when you take a step back and, and look at the, the clinical trials for Epidiolex, there were no deaths that were attributed to Epidiolex. And that's pretty reassuring. That said, only a, a couple thousand patients have been treated with Epidiolex and kept track of to find out if there are rare bad things happening. If there's a rare catastrophic side effect that only affects one in, say, 40,000 patients, probably wouldn't know it yet. So it's still early days, and we have to be careful with any new drug. How about the quality of the safety data for the other? Again, low quality. If, if patients are trying uh, CBD oil and having a really bad experience with it and, and an adverse effect that causes death, are we hearing about it? Not. You know, these reports are not making their way online. Uh, I will tell you that I have uh, one patient who died in the hospital having recently tried a cannabidiol oil. I don't know whether that played a role in uh, that patient's death, or maybe it, it kept that patient alive longer. I don't know. But we're not doing a good job to keep track of these patients and get a sense of the actual safety. So that, the quality of that safety data is low. Uh, that doesn't mean it's unsafe, just that we don't know. And the other big theme out there is that when you look online and you, you talk to, to physicians and other experts, you know, people are not saying that they don't know often enough. You know, there's still more questions 
uh, without answers than questions with answers at this point. So we need to be cautious about what we're saying. How about tolerability? How about side effects? Uh, Epidiolics is pretty well tolerated, especially uh, compared to other drugs on the market. You remember those rats on that spinning rotor rod? It's pretty well tolerated. The impression online is that the CBD oils and other products are even better tolerated. But none of these products have been studied head to head and there's no high quality study of those CBD oils and similar products. So again, quality of the data, very high for Epidiolex, pretty low for everything else. So this is just another big question that needs to be answered. Okay, DEA schedule, we talked about the difference there. Abuse potential, definitely low for Epidiolex, probably low for the other products. There, there is, uh, you know, if you give a marijuana aficionado a, uh, a say a blunt derived from a cannabidiol enriched plant, they're going to tell you it's not very good marijuana. Uh, there is not much street value for these products for people who are looking to enjoy the euphoria of these products. But it has not been studied in a rigorous fashion. So we don't actually know what that, that abuse potential is. And to the extent that there are, are challenges in manufacturing these products, some of the CBD oils have a fair bit of THC. And sometimes the batches are not containing the cannabinoids they are advertised to be containing. So it's very possible that you could go to a dispensary and buy a product that is advertised to be mostly CBD, and it might actually be mostly THC. Okay. Uh, legal status, so Epidiolex is totally legal. Everything else, according to the federal government and the DEA, is illegal. It's still Schedule 1. Product consistency. So Epidiolex is a, a very high quality pharmaceutically manufactured product. You can be confident that every batch is exactly the same. The same cannot be said of the CBD oils out there. Uh, you know, Many of those manufacturers are getting better, but I wouldn't say that they are good or great at this point. So let me give you an example of what I mean by inconsistency. So these are uh, you know, approximately monthly checks of the CBD and THC content of a patient's extract. And this was advertised to be a 20 to 1 ratio product. So you can actually see on the first one, things were looking pretty good. It's pretty close to 20 to 1. The next month, a little more THC. Is that meaningful? Maybe. I would say we don't know. And if we plot these out on a graph, this is what it looked like. It's kind of a problem. Now, we have to make a big fuss about epilepsy drugs and whether you have the brand or the generic, because the generic might be a little bit off, that it might be 10% over or 10% under. That sort of variability is nothing compared to what we're seeing with, with CBD oil. Okay. What if we, instead of plotting the concentration of CBD or THC, what if we look at the ratio over time? It's swinging wildly. So, you know, for the neurologist managing epilepsy, we like really consistent products. And, you know, if the patient is doing well in the beginning and then not doing well two months later, we want to know, well, is it because the product stopped working? We don't want to be scratching our heads and wondering, well, maybe they got a bad batch. Okay, so this is a, this is a big problem. And then remember that chart I showed you about Joe, Jill, and John. If your cannabidiol concentration is swinging all over the place, what's going to happen to that interaction? That interaction is going to be all over the place. So that's also a big concern. Do you trust the lab that gave us these numbers? <laughs> Maybe not. So there are a lot of different labs, and I'll tell you, we've sent individual products to five different labs and got five different answers about what is in that product. Uh, there are no standards. Uh, there are not common what we call reference standards as to how labs quantify these products. No one is regulating them. Big problem. Uh, typical dosage. The dosage of epidiolex in milligrams per kilogram per day of, of cannabidiol is very different than what is being used with other products. It's much lower. Why are these different? We don't have adequate answers. How about approximate cost? I think we've talked about this yet. So the, the best estimate at this point is that epidiolex will run about 30000 dollars per year. How much does CBD oil cost? Well, that of course varies depending on the specific product. Uh, with lower doses, the cost of most CBD oils is quite a bit cheaper, 
when I think about the patients who come into our clinic, they are often spending anywhere from several hundred dollars a month to several thousand dollars a month, depending on that dose. If you look at the price per gram of cannabidiol, these are actually very close. That was part of the reason, I suspect, why GW Pharma priced it the way they did. They did not want people to say, okay, well, now we've got some great rigorous data that cannabidiol works. I'm going to use a community product because I can get it cheaper. You actually can't get it cheaper at a, a gram per gram price. Okay, question. Oh, predicting the future. Insurance coverage. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's early days. We actually don't know. I suspect on-label prescribing, meaning if the patient has the this disorders for which it is approved, Lennox Gusteau syndrome or Dravet syndrome, commercial insurance at least will consistently pick up the price. I suspect other insurers will as well. If you don't meet criteria, diagnostic criteria for Lennox Gusteau syndrome or Dravet syndrome, you are probably in for at least a big fight, and it might be a losing battle, but I don't know. So far. So far, it's early days, we just don't know. The other thing to think about, well, you know, we, we have nice rigorous data saying that it works well for Lennox Gustav syndrome and Drovet syndrome. Is it good for other kinds of epilepsy? No reason to think not at this point. So there has been some, what we call open label treatment in a variety of other kinds of epilepsy and it appears to be doing pretty good across the board. We have not identified any subtypes of epilepsy that clearly don't respond to it. So, but the answer to that question is, I don't know. Sure. Uh, how do we move forward? Is that just, I uh, think we have a dialogue, it's like uh, trying to uh, categorize other epilepsy types into that, or is there something we in the community or you are, how can we make that move forward? Is it mm. or something else like that, you know? You need to vote today. Yeah. <laughs> And you need to elect representatives who want to spend more money on the National Institutes of Health to conduct these studies. So that, you know, if I were Greenwich Biosciences and I had this new product, I would invest my energy in selling this product online and trying to profit from it. I wouldn't spend all my money trying to study all the other forms of epilepsy. But what we need is those studies to look at every other kind of epilepsy. Uh, so, okay. vote and vote often. <laughs> Question. Um, going back to the studies, you were talking mostly children. Were any adults involved in the studies? Yes. So this included kids over age two and adults who had these same forms of epilepsy. Okay. Yeah. So so far, really no sign of age specificity. I mean, it uh, it is not the miracle you would hope for online. But the modest to moderate benefit that has been observed has been seen across the, the, the lifespan. Okay, what is the entourage effect? Anybody know? Okay, so when you think about um, traditional marijuana that has a fair bit of THC, there's this at least theory that is pretty well supported that uh, THC works better when there is some CBD present. And it may be that it works better when there's not only CBD present, but other plant chemicals called terpenes present. Would epidiolics take advantage of that possible entourage effect? It would not because it's pure cannabidiol. Would these other products that do have some THC and often do have substantial amounts of other plant components, would they be better? Maybe, we don't know, it hasn't been studied. So vote, vote often and let's get these studies done. Um, uh, we'll leave it there. Um, so we know that epidiolex does interact with, with Onfi or Clobazam. We suspect that the other products that are rich in cannabidiol would do the same, but we don't actually know. And we don't know how the presence of THC, even in small quantities, or the presence of other chemicals might impact that interaction. Okay, so certainly more research to come. Let me just open it up for questions real quick. Sure. Um, okay, so
Correct. <laughs> yep, easy question. Okay, so we're going to transition in a few minutes here to infantile spasms, but feel free to ask some more questions while people filter in or depart. Uh, there have definitely been reports of that happening, uh, not in the clinical trials. And the answer is we don't really know that it's doing that. Unfortunately, a lot of these patients are very young patients who have epilepsy that is changing over time. And if you happen to be taking any medication, whether it's cannabidiol or, or other, uh, it's very possible that your epilepsy could change over time at that time and you would get the impression that whatever you were doing was causing that transformation. Uh, so answers we don't really know, but I don't suspect that it's provoking other kinds of seizures. I don't think it's provoking a transformation of epilepsy. Are there any uh, antidepressant drugs that you would not do in the trials? Like you didn't want to do CBD with your on extra? Uh, yes, so there are a lot of medications that don't work well for lynx gusto syndrome and Drovet syndrome which weren't necessarily excluded, but they just didn't show up in those studies. So we don't know how these drugs interact and perform with a, a variety of drugs which fall under the category of sodium channel blockers. So these are things like Tegretol, Trileptol, uh, Aptium. We don't know really how they would work together. So that's definitely a, a focus of other research. There was another drug that works pretty darn well called Felbamate, uh, which is notorious for a really tiny risk of death. That drug was excluded from the studies. And we don't know how it would, it would perform. Okay. okay, so if we've exhausted cannabidiol, let's transition to infantile spasms. Okay, so these are again my disclosures, so a lot of relationships with the pharmaceutical industry. Let me just show, ooh, we're not up on the screen. It's called felbamate. Okay. Yeah, so the, the risk of death from hepatic failure is about 1 in 15,000 patients. So pretty darn small. Your next teaching is going to be infantile spasms. So this is a form of epilepsy that strikes infants, as you might guess. These are my disclosures. I'm going to show you a video of what these seizures look like. This is from uh, YouTube, and it's a great example. Okay, so that was the seizure. It's about one second long. They usually happen in a cluster, usually upon awakening. It can happen in sleep transitions. Okay, infantile spasms is another name for epileptic spasms. It means the same thing. The term West syndrome is the triad of this kind of seizure, a background pattern called hypsarrhythmia and similar patterns and having developmental delay from, from epilepsy. This is what hips arrhythmia looks like on the right. So the left panel shows you what normal brain waves look like. On the right, we've got these very chaotic brain waves. And we think that this pattern is what is causing problems for a lot of patients, that when they get these kinds of seizures and this kind of epilepsy, they stop developing. About half of kids are normal when their infantile spasms start. About half already have pre-existing problems from whatever is causing their infantile spasms. We figure out the cause in about two-thirds of cases. About one-third of patients with infantile spasms continue to have seizures and we don't know why. Uh, there are many different categories of the causes. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Many different causes. So genetic testing is a a really hot topic for epilepsy in general because when you're trying to figure out why you or your kid has epilepsy and we're making big progress you know compared to decades past uh, our ability to identify genetic causes of epilepsy was pretty low with new and unfortunately expensive technologies we're getting quite a bit better uh, usually the first test that people do is something called a chromosomal microarray. This is to actually pick, basically take a picture of chromosomes, look for extra chromosomes, missing chromosomes, or extra pieces of chromosomes, or missing pieces of chromosomes. It has about a 10% yield, meaning that 90% of people who have a genetic cause of, a, of their epilepsy do not get a result from a microarray. Uh, the next best thing we have these days is called a gene panel. So this is 
uh, a test in which we sequence about 100 genes in general, and that yield is about double, it's about 20%. The newest, best technology is called exome sequencing, and this is where we sequence all 22,000 genes, and that has a yield of about 40%. But well, we're only at 40%. So the vast majority, unfor unfortunately, who have a genetic cause of epilepsy, we can't figure out that genetic cause, and it's because it's complicated, unfortunately. So, making progress, but I'm not sure how fast additional progress will come. We shall see. So, how are kids with infantile spasms doing at age two? In general, not very well, is the unfortunate truth. Uh, so about 20% are normal or near normal, about 10 to 20% are dead, and the rest are doing very poorly in terms of having continued uncontrolled epilepsy, often autism, often poor development. Question? So a fatality rate of after two for that type of seizure, is that just because like, it, like uh, the vast majority are not sued up. There, there are some. Uh, it is, in most cases, probably a result of whatever is causing the epilepsy, not the seizures themselves. On the other hand, a lot of patients who are suffering from infantile spasms become what we call medically fragile, meaning they're not doing well. For example, they might not be controlling their secretions very well. They're at risk for having their saliva go into their lungs rather than their stomach and that carries a big risk of infection, and a big cause of death in this, in this group is fatal infection. Fatal infection? Um, yep. So my daughter's like four and a half, um, should I still be concerned about? I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Yeah, pretty, pretty low risk at that point. Thank you. So let's talk about what is happening to kids' IQ with infantile spasms. So normal IQ is 100, and there's a, a pretty big spread. You have to be quick in identifying infantile spasms. So compared to patients who are diagnosed quickly and receive treatment within a week of onset, that's kind of the gold standard, those who wait even one additional week, those kids will lose about four IQ points when you test them later in childhood. If you wait another two weeks, you lose another four points. If you wait, wait another month, you lose another four points. You wait more than two months, you lose another four points. How are we doing in terms of our speed of diagnosis? This is UCLA data, and I think we're actually pretty good, and we're quite obviously doing pretty badly. So about a third of our patients are diagnosed and treated very quickly, under a week. About a third are in the two to eight week range, which we just saw is accompanied by a pretty major intellectual hit. And then about a third, it's, it's just terrible, that we're many months out, and a lot of the harm caused by infantile spasms has already been imparted to those children. So my question maybe for you is how do we educate the general population about infantile spasms? We, we do things like Epilepsy Awareness Day. I am willing to guess that there's not a single person in this room who is totally healthy and has a totally healthy infant and is here to learn about infantile spasms. I know that's a safe assumption, but those are the people I need to reach. Those are the people who need to see that first video and know what infantile spasms look like. Uh, so, parents are part of the problem, unfortunately. Physicians are a big part of the problem, and probably a bigger part of the problem because we have a responsibility to know about the different diseases out there. The problem is that infantile spasms is kind of rare. The average pediatrician will see three new cases in their career. So how do I convince those pediatricians to pay attention for more than 30 seconds and remember it for 30 years? I'm open to any ideas you have. Uh, pay them. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Uh, we need to make this a, a priority for something that needs to be remembered by general pediatricians, by emergency room physicians, and unfortunately neurologists too. A lot of neurologists who won't make that diagnosis with that first description. Part of the problem is that these are clusters of seizures that are happening upon first awakening. So it's kind of like bringing your car to the mechanic when it's not making the noise. Trying to describe what you saw is really hard. You know, How would you describe the episodes that I showed you in that first video. Well, 
you know, my son was doing something and it lasted a second. Yeah. It can be awake or sleep. It's usually at sleep transitions. But you know, the pediatrician is going to say, yeah, infants do a lot of funny looking stuff. Don't worry about it. And 99% of the time, they're right. But that 1% that they're wrong, that 1% is being harmed. So put your thinking hats on, and if you figure out a good way to educate everybody, let me know. One of our thoughts these days is to try to, uh, you know, via social media and by kind of email blasts, to enroll as many pregnant women as possible, and that when those future children are turning three months old, that an email blast with that video goes out so that people can. How, how do you get people to read their junk mail? Unfortunately, it's really hard. I mean, if you saw, you know, let's say you were a parent who was doing fine and was unaffected by epilepsy, would you read a junk mail from a foundation that sounded benevolent? Uh, I don't know. If you're anything like me, you probably wouldn't. It's scary. Yeah. I think I think there are a lot of competing emotions out there that, you know, what one common thing is that uh, yes, the parents see something and they're concerned. They don't know what it is, and they ask their mother or father-in-law, and they're a new parent, and the mother and father-in-law, eh, don't worry about it. We've had, we've had four kids, so we obviously know everything about all kids, and you shouldn't worry. That, a lot of that kind of conversation is happening. Uh, yeah. Let me know what you think. Yep. I don't know how we improve upon that. Uh, but I will say that the presence of videos on YouTube and other sites has actually dramatically changed our ability to make this diagnosis. We get tons of second opinions where people send us a video and we tell them, ooh, this looks concerning or that doesn't look concerning. Uh, and the ability for parents to walk into the office with a video of these suspicious events is huge. I mean, it's, it's the difference between your car not making the sound or making the sound because of the mechanic. Now, when we started with her in 2009, I think she was one of the first three videos on YouTube I ever saw. There was no support yeah. there's no social media. So, I mean, sorry to say it, but I'm on there all the time, like, telling people, oh my God, UCLA, go to UCLA. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's actually incredibly useful. A lot of the comments you see in these videos, it's, it's like, uh, don't go to your neighborhood neurologist. Go to these places or go to a children's hospital. Don't leave without a video EEG. These, these sorts of advice, which are actually very good. And I would say that most of the comments in those videos are actually right on the money. The people are, that, that you know, once you are indoctrinated in infantile spasms, you're pretty good at knowing what they look like. And you can be a pretty good partner to parents who are new to the situation. So. By all means, participate. Uh, let me skip this here. Okay, let's talk about the treatments out there. This story has unfortunately not changed much in the last generation. So there are two approved medications for the treatment of infantile spasms. One is called ACTH, one is called Vigabitrin, and a small number of patients are candidates for surgery. About five to ten percent. These are patients who have only a single piece of brain that is misbehaving and is the source of all seizures. And if you take out that piece of brain, you can cure their seizures in many cases. So, ACTH works about 55 percent of the time. Uh, there are about a third of patients who experience a relapse over the following year or two. Vigabitrin only works about 36 percent of the time. Uh, the one exception being patients with a disorder called tuberous sclerosis, their response rate is more like 60 percent. Surgery among good candidates is about 70% effective. We need these numbers to be 100%. Uh, I noticed that um, prednisone is not on there. Ah, it's coming. I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, side effects. These are pretty big. So ACTH is associated with immunosuppression. There is probably about a 1 in 400 risk of death taking ACTH. And uh, the risk is because the immune system of that infant is suppressed by ACTH, and they are now vulnerable to little infections like an ear infection, becoming big infections like pneumonia, or infections of the blood, or infections of the brain. 
Bigabitrin carries some risk of vision loss, which is well defined in adults. It's about one third of patients have permanent peripheral vision loss. Infants, it looks like this risk is closer to zero. Uh, that's unfortunately not the message most providers give to their patients. Yeah, well, I will tell you, if, if instead of having a, a group of parents and community representatives, we had a, a group of pediatric neurologists, they would all say, yes, the risk of vision loss with Vigabitrin is about 30%. And then you'd ask them, well, how many of your patients have clinically meaningful vision loss, meaning it's impacting that kid's life? Not a single hand will go up in a room this size. That is the, the, the message that we're, we're struggling to get out there. Um, you know, the, the, there's a little bit of a changing tide, but not as fast as we want. Okay, so when you think about surgery, the people who think about doing surgery on kids with infantile spasms are the big epilepsy programs who have an epilepsy surgeon. So if you're at a center that doesn't have a surgeon, probably not going to be offered epilepsy surgery or even have it investigated. Um, this is kind of a, a quick guide to epilepsy surgery evaluation. You do the EEG, trying to figure out where the seizures show up on the EEG. You take a picture of the brain, looking for a lesion or something that's abnorm and abnormal. You hope that that's in the same place as the EEG. And then you often do a, a test like a PET scan or a SPECT scan, and you look for a, an abnormality there, and you look to hopefully show that it matches up in all three tests, that the same hopefully small piece of brain is misbehaving in all three tests, and that gives you some confidence that it truly is the cause of seizures and the only cause of seizures. When those line up, we often take out that piece of brain, and those response are, are, are quite good, about 70%, and the relapse risk after successful surgery is exceptionally low, so much lower than the relapse we see with ACTH or Vigabitrin. Uh, if you're queasy, close your eyes. This is a picture of a brain in the operating room where we are doing what is called electrocorticography. So this is EEG not on the scalp, this is EEG on the brain. And we are searching for the brain that is electrically abnormal. So in many cases of infantile spasms, the abnormality that is causing the spasms is pretty darn subtle. You might not see it in an MRI. And that if you were to look at the brain or touch the brain, you could not see or feel the part that's abnormal. You can see the area that's abnormal based on how it behaves electrically. Uh, and this is kind of the, the final stop when we're trying to figure out exactly what brain tissue to remove in one of these surgeries. Uh, this is a picture of a CT scan before and after one of these surgeries. You can see on the picture on your right, you've got a big chunk of missing brain here. Uh, this is one of our patients who did fantastically. Okay, back to the prednisolone issue. So we didn't talk about prednisolone. So ACTH is a compound that's made in the brain. Your body makes ACTH and it travels down to your kidneys, and your kidneys make a, a chemical called cortisol. It's really important for maintaining blood pressure, for waking up. Prednisolone is the same as cortisol. So one of the thoughts out there was, well, you don't have to give ACTH, you could just give the downstream chemical from ACTH. This is hotly debated though. And you could even ask the neurologist at this meeting and you will get some very different answers. My own belief is that they are probably equally effective. I don't have proof. I think they both have a high burden of side effects. They have very different cost. So ACTH in the United States is about 125 to 150,000 per patient. Uh, prednisolone is about $100. And the, the caveat though there is, what if I'm wrong about these being equally effective? What is the cost of an otherwise normal kid having uncontrolled infantile spasms? Big difference. So, uh, the cost of ACTH now is really small, and that's in comparison to the cost of treatment failure. So the tr cost of treatment failure is about seven million. So that's the cost of all of those future hospitalizations, all of the future medication trials, uh, nursing support, you name it. There's a lot of things that can very quickly drive up cost, especially over a lifetime. And that cost, so even if ACTH is just a little bit better, you should probably be willing to try it. Now given this uncertainty, our approach at UCLA is to try prednisolone first. If it's not working after two weeks, try the ACTH just in case. Very, pe very few people have equipoise like we do. Uh, mo most centers will be very in favor of prednisolone and will never even offer you ACTH. A lot of other centers will 
only believe that ACTH must be superior and won't even mention prednisolone. So that is also another conversation that needs to be had. I have a quick question. I kind of beat myself up because at the time, uh, we went to Kaiser and the neurologist gave us prednisone um, and scared us to death and said that ACTH is going to kill our kids and has really had that three not want to use it. And it scared us to death, so we were like, yeah, whatever, you know, I guess that wasn't an option at the time. Um, yeah, I would say they have three medications, three or four or five medications. Like at this point, I feel like maybe no medication would have helped. But do you think that that, that is still something that could could potentially be an outstanding? Maybe an option. So when we look at our pace, we we just looked at the last hundred and two patients uh, who came through UCLA, and were started on hormonal therapy, meaning prednisolone, and sixty percent responded. And then we, when we looked at the 40 patients who then tried ACTH as a backup, it worked for 33% of them. Now, I don't know if it, they responded because ACTH is better or different, or because they just needed a longer course of any hormonal therapy. But I would say if two weeks of prednisone didn't work, I'd, I'd try ACTH. We did six, two six-month rounds, and uh, the, the prednisone, it cleared the hips arrhythmia, but it was, she, uh, she still had like the spikes and waves and so, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. So, not good enough is the answer. Comment? Yep. Okay, so Vigabitrin, uh, we talked about this briefly. It's about 60% effective among kids with TSE. It's only about 35% effective among everybody else. This is an artist's rendition of the vision loss that you could theoretically get with it. We kind of see this in adults, so about 33% of adults will get permanent bi bilateral vision loss. But you can see that the center of their vision depicted on the right is still intact. And the vast majority of adults who have vision loss from myocabitrin don't know that they have vision loss. They know because their ophthalmologist has, has done that test, you know, where you sit down and you've got your chin on the thing and there's this hemisphere and you're looking at lights and you're pressing the button. They don't do very good on that test but they're just fine otherwise. So should they be worried about that vision loss? Well, yeah, everyone should be worried if you're going to take a medication that jeopardizes your vision. But if the alternative is ongoing infantile spasms that jeopardize everything, including your vision, you probably shouldn't be worried about it. And our, our whole approach to kind of warn people about the risk of uh, vision loss because we don't want to get sued, that really needs to change. We should warn them about not trying Vigalotrin. Okay, so my sense is that in infants and younger children, the risk of meaningful vision loss is closer to zero. There are some other side effects that are more common and that are specific to infants. So this is a picture of a kid's brain on Vigabitrin, and these kind of bright, light gray, white areas are not supposed to look like that. So this was from the Vigabitrin. This kid became comatose because of this side effect. And when we stopped the Vigabitrin on the right, this is what they're supposed to look like. The kid woke up also worked to treat the infantile spasms. This is a kind of scary side effect, and there's some worry that it could even be fatal in rare cases. So for example, if a patient dies taking Vigabitrin, we don't usually think, ah, oh, this could have been a Vigabitrin side effect because the patient is dead, they didn't get an MRI, we didn't look for it. There's probably a little bit of a risk that people should, should worry about, and this is what we should warn par parents about, not the vision. So we're, we're making you worry about a lot of stuff, but not making you worry about the right stuff. Question. Nope, I, I, w I would just say watch out for it. Uh, as you get older, the risk is lower, and if you haven't gotten the side effect in the first couple months, probably not going to get it. That's my guess. Um, that said, if an MRI was done at this point and you're on Vigabitrin, it's fairly common that you'll see these things on the MRI, but there won't be any symptoms. That happens in about 20% of kids. In general, it's not clear what you do about it. My sense is if it's working and Vigabitrin is the thing that's keeping those spasms away, don't worry about it. But if Vigabitrin isn't working, this would be an extra reason to get off sooner and try something else. How long would you use Vigabitrin if it wasn't working? All over the place. That answer is unknown. We do about a year. But if you asked the folks in this conference, you'd get two months, two years, lifetime, okay. don't try it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer unknown. Okay. okay. So related to that question, the reason why we do it for a year is because we've seen that at least among the good responders who have tuberous sclerosis, 
that if you keep a high dose over the first year, the patients with higher doses have lower risk of relapse. Don't know if this extends to all patients with infantile spasms. And to kind of summarize Vigabitrin, I would think about the risks this way. The risk of vision loss, very low. The risk of these weird MRI side effects that sometimes cause things like coma, substantial, but not that bad, especially when you compare it to the risk of not responding to anything. So your worry about Vigabitrin should be that it might not work, not that it can cause these weird side effects. Okay, so we've got some kind of two classes of therapy, and the question is, well, which one should you do? By and large, there's pretty good data showing that the hormonal therapies, meaning ACTH or prednisolone, are better, that this balance will favor the ACTH and the prednisolone. But maybe we shouldn't be choosing between these therapies. Maybe we should be choosing between doing one or both. And when we do that, there's, there's been a great study showing that the combination of vigabitrin with hormonal therapy is much better at least 14 days into treatment. It's not clear that that benefit extends in terms of developmental outcomes or meaningful lifetime outcomes after the year of age of, of one or so. So still a lot of research that we're waiting for to mature. Um, but seeing this data from this paper, where the response rate at two weeks was quite a bit better, 72% versus only 57%, we have adopted this and we now do prednisolone and vigabitrin right from the start. So day one, you get both therapies. If you were to compare and contrast these two approaches, there's some pros and cons. Um, so on the left, choosing prednisolone or vigabitrin, you save some money because you're only doing one drug. You're at probably lower risk of these weird vigabitrin side effects. And if it works and you're only on one therapy, you know that the one therapy you used is what worked. If on the other hand, you were doing the opposite option that you were using two drugs, you're going to spend more for two drugs, especially if those two drugs are ACTH and vigabitrin. So ACTH, again, being about 125,000 per course. Vigabitrin for a typical six to 12 month course is about 60,000, so neither drug is cheap. Your risk of those weird MRI side effects is probably substantially higher with that combination. And if you're on two drugs and it works, you won't really know which one worked. So you'd be caught thinking, well, yes, my kid was on Vigabitrin when spasms went away. Should I keep going with Vigabitrin for a year knowing it has all these weird side effects? You wouldn't know. But I would say all that matters is whether or not your kid responds. If your kid responds and you don't really know why, it's a great problem to have. Okay, so this is a picture of our protocol. Uh, it's complicated. Don't worry about it. There are a bunch of other medications that are advertised to work that have not been adequately studied. My sense is that all of these don't work all that great. Okay, so a lot of you were here for the last talk, so I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly. So there's a lot of interest in cannabidiol and cannabidiol-enriched products, uh, including Charlotte's Web, pictured here. And when we think about the different products out here, we can kind of define them as the artisanal cannabis extracts. So these include things like Charlotte's Web, products that go under the classification of CBD oil, hemp products, unfortunately very little research, but a fair bit of experience which has been described online and which has inspired pharmaceutical development of this product. You've got the pure cannabidiol, which is the now FDA-approved product, Epidiolex, for treatment of two different kinds of epilepsy. This is made by GW Pharmaceuticals, which is also called Greenwich Biosciences here in the United States. And there's also synthetic cannabidiol, so cannabidiol that's not from a plant, that's made in a laboratory. Uh, and uh, the main developer of that right now is a company called Insys, uh, who's based in Arizona. And they have an ongoing phase three clinical trial for new onset infantile spasms. So these are, uh, this is a, a study where they take patients who, in, who get a diagnosis of infantile spasms today and are ready to start a therapy, and they are now entered in a trial where they get either cannabidiol with vigabitrin or a placebo with vigabitrin, trying to figure out if the additional cannabidiol improves response rates. So stay tuned. Hopefully in a couple of years we'll have some results. So when we think about cannabidiol and you read online, you get this immediate impression that it works for everybody, that it never doesn't work, and then there will be a couple reports here and there that it doesn't work. Um, if you, and I said this in our last lecture if you were present, that uh, if you were a spy in our pediatric epilepsy clinic, you would get the opposite impression, that it's not working very often, but every once in a while it does work. And we were seeing that it was working enough that we were wondering if it actually is effective. And that's what has uh, inspired a lot of the trials so far. 
and we'll kind of show you some data. So on the left here, uh, we have the reported effectiveness for treatment of infantile spasms in Linus Cousteau syndrome. It was very good. And we followed that up with a rigorous trial where we did a, a baseline video EG, identified the spasms, identified hip arrhythmia, treated those patients for two weeks on cannabidiol, and these were only patients who had already failed ACTH and bicapturin and who didn't have great options. And then we repeated a video EG at day 14. And this is what it looked like. We had one patient respond, so one out of nine. We expected that only about 1% of patients over two weeks will stop having infantile spasms. And what do I mean by that? So if you look at everybody who has infantile spasms who is not being treated, about 1% will stop having spasms all by themselves without treatment every two weeks. And we saw that it was one out of nine, so is one out of nine better than 1%? If you ask a st statistician, you would say, well, it looks good, but we're not sure. And that's why we're now doing this big study with Insys Therapeutics, looking at about 200 patients, treating them first line to focus on patients who are likely to respond to an effective therapy. Uh, this is the EEG before and after for that single responder. It was pretty, pretty bad before. The patient took a single dose of cannabidiol and the spasms disappeared. They're having about 100 spasms per day at baseline, none for the first five days of treatment, had a single brief cluster on day six, and no more through the end of the study at day 14, had a good looking EEG on day 14, but it was only one of nine patients. Uh, you said one dose, one time? <coughs> one dose, they were treated twice a day for the entire period. Okay. That same patient then relapsed several weeks after the end of the study. Uh, we increased the dose of cannabidiol at that point and that didn't do the trick. So the patient has done pretty well. It's not seizure free, but again, was a patient who had infantile spasms for about a year before we even tried this therapy. So we're still trying to figure it out. And, and kind of the, the big definitive study is now ongoing. This is kind of what it looks like. So to summarize that pharmaceutical development, we're making progress, but there's not an FDA approved cannabis derived or synthetic cannabidiol for infantile spasms. And uh, I would summarize a couple key points here. Prednisolone and ACTH, despite being scary, and in the case of ACTH being very expensive, are the most effective single type of therapy. Vicabitrin is a second best option. The combination of these two things is probably even better. Surgery is a great option if you're a good surgical candidate, but most people are not good surgical candidates. All other therapies, the long list, are not all that effective. We absolutely need more research to identify better products. Cannabidiol is promising. It's the only drug in phase three trials now for infantile spasms. There are about a dozen other therapies that are either at the, st at the level of being tested in animals or are in earlier stage clinical trials. So there's a lot coming down the pike, but nothing that's ready for new patients who have infantile spasms today. Okay. And big take home points. Don't be afraid of side effects or cost. Be afraid of infantile spasms not being controlled. And yet just, there, there's a lot of stuff that gets people nervous and scared when it comes to infantile spasms and you gotta just focus on getting rid of the spasms. Okay, any questions? Sure. Is there an age where they stop, like they, so you get to in general, yes. The vast majority of people will stop having infantile spasms with or without therapy by about age two. There's a, a fair minority who will keep going until about age four or five, and there are vanishingly few patients who will continue into adulthood. Um, that's part of the reason why there's been a little bit of a shift in what we call these. So the, the traditional term for these seizures had been infantile spasms, and still is for many people. Uh, the technically correct classification is called epileptic spasms, and that reflects the fact that these have been seen in adults. Uh, but you don't want your spasms to keep going and then go away all by themselves at age two. You know, when that happens, you've kind of already suffered the consequences of infantile spasms. Question? Can it turn into other forms of epilepsy? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, in the majority of patients, even when you stop the spasms, they develop other kinds of epilepsy. Sometimes those are bad kinds of epilepsy, like lennox Gastaut syndrome. Sometimes they're not that bad kinds of epilepsy that are far easier to manage. And it's, it's all over the place as to the individual experiences. Anything else? I've worn you out. And if there, if there are questions you want to ask, not in front of everybody, we can do that then too. I think I've stopped with extra time. She's been on it for a year and a half. 
has has been on what? Good. Um, higher risk of these relatively subtle volume side effects as you get older. It's a, probably a reasonable thing to do. So Vigabitrin is approved to specifically treat infantile spasms. It's also approved to treat focal seizures. My sense is though that it doesn't work as well for focal seizures. And there are a lot of other options. So it would also be reasonable to stop the Vigabitrin at this point and try other stuff. Okay, question about the age thing again. So like the adults that were having the spasms, do they like start off with either hips or the OS syndrome or something and then as a 25 hour old adult they still continue to have them or was it like oh this 19 year old started to have epileptic spasms? Both are possible. Okay. And the patients who were not having infantile spasms and then got these as an adult, they are really different. Okay. And, and trying to lump them in this group of patients is probably not wise. They, they probably respond to other therapies um, and what we see works in this younger age group is not the same as what works for them. They will probably go away. They probably will go and away. if they're still happening and, you, and you're not actively making them go away, they will probably turn into something else. Like or like kind of most common syndrome that they transform into is this Lennox Cousteau syndrome. Those are definitely the common seizures in Lennox Cousteau syndrome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, the typical thing is at diagnosis to have very brief seizures that are just one second long. That's it. When those are not controlled, they tend to get less abundance. You're not getting hundreds a day, you're getting 10 a day, but they tend to be longer. Five seconds. And then once you're more like 10 years old, you're getting ones that are like 30 seconds long. And those are called tonic seizures. So my, my sense is that infantile spasms often morph into tonic seizures in those kind of early childhood years. But there are a lot of possible evolutions. Yeah. I just wanted to ask: Is infantile spasms are related to SCN2A, right? They often are. So infantile spasms are 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 linked to about 300 different genetic disorders. SCN2A, especially SCN2A deletions, are pretty common. But that, even those are probably maybe three or four percent of all infantile spasms. So, not that common. Say that again? They're linked They are. Uh, but even, even less than SCN2A, and I think you said SCN8A. Uh, that is a, it's still early, so it's definitely linked to SCN8A. What percentage of patients with infantile spasms have an SCN8A problem, I don't know. I can tell you at UCLA, I believe we have three out of 520. So, Less than one percent, but maybe we didn't recognize a lot of them. Um, the, the other thing is that when you have infantile spasms and you haven't figured out an obvious cause, and you use medication that works beautifully, you stop looking for the cause, and that's I think that's okay. It's not very useful from the research standpoint, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to be doing a lot of expensive uh, genetic testing if your kid's doing great. A whole genome, is, you know, the tech. Oh, Paul G. Um, I am trying to remember if those are on neighboring parts of the same chromosome. I don't know. Uh, there have been a, a few cases of G. It's not a very common cause of infantile spasms. And uh, unfortunately, with a lot of the genetic testing now, is that you do the testing and you get no definitive answer, and then the company says, well, no definite answer, but we've got these three or four things that look suspicious. So it's really common to come back with two or three or four suspicious abnormalities and not and to not really know if those are definitely the cause. Do you think uh, you gear your treatments towards maybe like a metabolic issue, like different, like maybe the ketogenic diet will work out for like a metabolic issue opposed to like a genetic issue or something like that? Uh, so almost all of the metabolic things are also genetic. Okay. So it's like a genetic thing that is causing a metabolic problem. Uh, there are a few specific metabolic disorders which are definitely good candidates for the ketogenic diet. There's one called uh, gluten transporter dysfunction, 
And this is where you, there's a defect in the brain where you can't get sugar into the brain. And so instead of having the brain depend on sugar as, as its main form of fuel, you give a totally different fuel. Uh, and that's the one example where the ketogenic diet is clearly effective for infertile spasms. In all of the other cases, it's not as clear. Why it is effective. Or that it is effective. Yeah, a lot of debate there. Are you personally a fan of the ketogenic diet, could I ask you? I am not. Well, I would say this. In general, I'm a big fan. So for the treatment of epilepsy in general, it's a fantastic therapy. It's highly effective. For infantile spasms, a lot of the data suggesting that it, work, that it works is pretty low quality. Uh, in recognizing that, we don't jump to the ketogenic diet very early in our treatment at UCLA. So the approximately 30 patients we've treated have generally failed a lot of therapies up front. So they tend to be patients who are really hard to treat where the odds of response to anything are not that great. And among that group, only one patient has responded. So I, I, my main answer is, I don't know. Uh, among centers where they use ketogenic diet very early in the course, including one where they use it first line, they are describing much better results, but still low quality research designs where we don't actually know whether there's a placebo impact. And a lot of times the, the follow up of doing video EGs after therapy to, prove, to you know, absolutely prove response and look for any relapse, those aren't happening for ketogenic diet yet. What we really need is something that resembles what Grinch Biosciences did with these randomized controlled trials. That's what we want to see for the ketogenic diet. But it's hard to do those studies in infants. So we're kind of stuck not knowing. Yeah. Okay, because they're out of ammo. Okay, good. And we got away without any tomatoes. So it was a successful day. Well, f feel free to come up at the end. Um, otherwise, thanks for coming to Epilepsy Awareness Day. Thanks for your attention.